Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our community design B day. Uh, for audience who are joined the previous sessions, welcome back. Uh, I'm your moderator, Emily. I'm an uh, I'm an experienced designer in EPAM office. So before we start, I would like uh, to encourage our audience you to ask questions throughout the presentation. So on the top right corner of your screen, please make sure you open up your uh, Q&A uh, speech chat and uh, uh, the rest of the audience will be able to see your, your question and vote for you uh, by giving it get big, by giving it a little thumbs up to your question. So um, at the end of the talk, we'll do the Q&A section with the uh, speaker. So we do have a prize today for the, own, uh, the owner of the most valuable question. Uh, you will get a one year subscription of Balsamic Cloud, a wireframe tool is an awesome tool. So make sure you um, don't write as an anon anonymous, write your name so we can pick a winner. Um, all right, our speaker is here. He is our principal of experience designer, uh, uh, principal of experience consulting at Impact <clears throat> Continuum. So over his years of his career, he has been helping our clients to adapt to change in the best possible way. So today I'm very excited to have him to share with us his insights on impact, uh, impact, of, impact of good design can bring the, to the business and how he creates impact using design and research. Um, without further ado, I will hand over the stage to Peter Arts. Um, why context matter, three steps, how structural UX research leads to business success, please. Well, thanks Emily for introducing me and thanks uh, to you all for having me. I'm uh, gonna share my screen and I hope that this will work I would well, um, well, first of all, I'm great to be here and share my knowledge and experience as all speakers do today. Um, and I think that's the biggest advantage of being part of such a big company like EPEN with artists, designers and engineers um, and have the opportunity to learn from each other, learn from our clients, but also learn from each other. And I think it's a great day, uh, such an event, even the situation in Belarus, as we all know, is quite unstable. So all the people from Minsk here from the Netherlands um, thinking of you take care hang in and uh, good luck fingers crossed um, well yes um, why this talk um, I think uh, Andy uh, and Jay before me uh, in that time slot already touched a lot of things that I will also cover which is basically why is design good for business that's a more holistic question, but also make it more practical. How can we uh, at EPAM with our clients make design as valuable uh, as uh, possible? And I think, um, yes, we need to help our clients adapt to change and we need design, research, UX and uh, in a user and context driven approach uh, to do so and to achieve it. Um, Jay and Andy were more, I think, into the design ops subject. Um, there is some overlap, uh, but I will especially dive in the second part more into why contextual research, user research, user based kind of working uh, pays off uh, and it should does. Um, to start with my talk, I think it's good to have a sort of an opening um, to get a picture or the frame wide. I think um, what the late Steve Jobs really understood when he was doing stuff at Apple is that design is of course a kind of a definition which is sometimes hard to explain. People think of design as aesthetics, yes it is aesthetics, but design is much more than this. Um, and I think this quote of him sums it up really appropriate in my opinion. Um, design is how it works. As Andy and Jay already said, most people we work with have a problem or a set of problems, challenges, and it's the trick to discover those problems, make them really tangible and clear and help them to solve them. And that's why uh, design and creative thinking in general is important. Well, my speech talk will be uh, in three parts. 
a short part about myself. Then I will dive into the topic design and business. And to finish off, I really love to share some of our work, two cases, and also make sure that we have a sort of three step model which you can apply from tomorrow onwards. Uh, how we can create impact uh, for our clients. Well, um, it's been said before, uh, we're living in very strange times. Think alone of COVID-19, but also in general, technology, disruption, transformation, uh, it's all about change. And I think this quote by Charles Darwin really uh, makes it very clear where the trick or the solution lies to deal with change. Um, and if you look at our clients nowadays as EPEM itself, I think in general it's about how are we able to cope with change in a way that it's helping us and our clients and the end users, their clients, uh, to stay ahead and help them solve their daily challenges, the daily problems. Um, adapt or die. If you look at COVID-19 as a good example, of course, it's really disruptive. It's really having a massive impact on every one of us, society. In the Netherlands, for instance, a very concrete example, during COVID-19, supermarkets like Albert Heijn, client of EPEM, were really doing a lot of good work and had a good business. People had to stay at home. The supermarket was the life chain and they really made the right steps in the right order to uh, surface and facilitate the process. On the other hand, Schiphol, one of the biggest airports in Europe, really had a lockdown of several weeks. And I think the whole aircraft or airline industry is, um, uh, is having their problems and their challenges uh, as well. Good. Um, short about myself. Um, I was born in Eindhoven, city here in the Netherlands, famous for the Philips technology company. And I think Eindhoven is really a typical example of a company town, uh, a town in which production of industrial goods was really important, but also the design and the engineering of it. And it was no wonder that in Eindhoven, there was also the Design Academy Eindhoven, one of the best colleges in the world regarding industrial design. And Eindhoven had really a sort of DNA, a sort of culture in which artists, designers, inventors, engineers and salespersons were really important to make both Philips and Duff trucks, which you see here, were made successful. But after the industry went away, Eindhoven had also a challenge to reinvent itself. And nowadays I think Eindhoven is in the Netherlands more or less the economic, economic driver, engine, but with high-tech industry combined with technology, innovation, and also design. And I think that's for more cities in the world, their challenge, but it really shows that a combination of being an engineer or being a thinker, artist, designer, and be able to sell those ideas is very important also in the world that is changing. Um, Eindhoven is also the city and the host of the Dutch Design Week, a yearly festival, a week about design and especially about how can design uh, change the way how we handle challenges. Think of healthcare, mobility, smart cities, circular economy. There are big challenges and creative thinking in general can help to solve them. Um, personally, I'm involved in the Dutch Design Week as well as the Dutch Design Awards and the Dutch Digital Agencies. And I think Dutch design in general is a sort of trademark for design that's empathic, design that's solution driven, and also um, design that can be a driver or even a facilitator uh, for change. Um, Looking at uh, my career, um, I worked for some Dutch design agencies from the middle of the 1990s onwards. Um, in that respect, I have the same kind of generation as uh, Andy <laughs> and this picture of his modem, his 56K modem 
is quite familiar for me as well. Um, to be uh, honest, I start doing digital stuff in 1996, 1997, using, I think, all the stuff at that moment for Netscape 1.0 that was just released and helping out clients with their first kind of digital products, which were most of the times only a homepage or a, a sort of intranet solution, very basic. Um, working um, at the digital side from 1996, 1997 onwards um, meant that I was also part of the Dutch creative industries. And I think in the Netherlands, the Dutch creative industries are really important for as a sector, but also as an enabler to deliver value to other sectors. And our king, here is our king, Willem Alexander, he's now having a beard. This is a photo of a couple of years ago. Uh, made a very good statement three years ago on a creative uh, event in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. He said, well, in my opinion, the creative industry is what we call the steam engine of the 21st century. Um, when I was working for 15, 20 years, um, I made a decision to follow a special new kind of education, an MBA specialized in design and brand management. And uh, one of my tutors in that period was Adriaan van Hooydonk. He's Dutch, a Dutch designer, but he's working as chief design officer at BMW. And Adriaan was really, really inspiring in giving me a new kind of set of ideas about our clients. As a designer, you not only work for the end user or for your client, but you work for a lot of different stakeholders. And working at BMW, like Adrian is doing, means that he's really a person who can handle different kind of mindsets. And I think for every designer or design professional, that's really a, a good way to look at your career. Um, are you in your design bubble and are you comfortable in that? Try to break out of it. Um, as he stated, he said, at BMW, my main responsibility is to validate design to persons who only are used to watch, read and compose Excel sheets all day. And of course, he's having a great team of people working on BMW models sometimes for years. Uh, it's a huge investment to have a new car out, electric or not. Um, so the responsibilities are high, the stakes are high. But he said, I really if you take my job serious, need to bridge a gap between the left hand side of the brain and the right side, right hand side of the brain. And I think this is um, a visual that sums that up quite nice. Um, I think most creative people like with an EBAM and with our clients uh, are normally a bit more right brain oriented, while a lot of clients and also probably engineers, people from the technology, uh, um, spot are more left and brain oriented. But I think in the end, and that's I think my personal mission, but also for our team within EPAM, um, it's about bridging that gap and building uh, a bridge. Yes, and um, with my, um, let's say, experience, why did I choose for EPAM uh, a year ago? I think it's really a good time uh, to be involved in such a company, a technology company. Uh, the meaning and impact of technology is growing. Um, technology is for our clients too vital to leave it to a external partner or vendor alone. And I think we in EPEM are pretty much sometimes in poor position because we can think, we can analyze, we can design, but also we can build and implement. And I think we make stuff that works uh, and deliver stuff that really does the job. So, um, talking about technology and companies, technology and our clients. Um, this is a picture of Seoul in Korea. A couple of years ago, uh, it's a known sample where Tesco uh, had an innovation project in which people were able, when they were commuting, to have a touchscreen, uh, make the order for shopping at a touchscreen while they waited on the tube. And then after two or three or four stops, they were able to collect those stuff. Um, very simple, very user-friendly, very seamless, 
but you should realize that on the back end, it's totally complex. It's really, really hard to achieve this. And I think that's one of the things that we as EPAM with our clients should deliver. Very simple, very user-friendly, very design-like, empathic uh, experiences on the front side and make sure that it happens, the magic more or less on the back end. Um, this is Albert Heijn in the Netherlands. Of course, Albert Heijn is a big supermarket chain, but this is the new warehouse of Albert Heijn here in Zaandam in the Netherlands, and it's completely automated. And that's, of course, also one of the things that we experience here in the Netherlands that classic retailers like Albert Heijn are now really developing a new skill set and a new kind of strategy in which they claim, okay, we are a retailer, we are gonna be the best in omni-channel supermarket experience, but also we need to become for part a real technology company. And that's where EPEM comes in and can help them. That's my uh, my um, belief. Okay, um, that was my personal kind of setting. Why I like design, why I like design to take serious and create with design impact for companies, organizations. Um, the second part is more about the relationship between design and management, design and decision makers in brands, corporates, also the public sector. And I think to start with this, it's nice to have some quotes and some ideas of people from the, let's say, last 20, 30 years. This is Peter Drucker. He's a management guru from America from the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. And one of his very good statements was still very actionable. Um, he's telling people over and over again, yes, you can have skilled people doing their things really good, but in the end, it's about doing the right things in the right order. The same goes for Jacob Nielsen. He's one of the founders of the Norman Nielsen Group, a big hero of usability. And he really claims that if you are having only five real users, you can really gather essential insights in the user experience of a product or a service. And there's no rocket science. You can easily find five real users. And the sooner, the better is my experience. This is Clayton Christensen. Um, he just passed away, uh, professor at Harvard Business School. And I think he's quite important, not only because he coined the frame of radical and disruptive innovation, but also he published over and over about why jobs to be done for the real customers are so important for innovation and successful innovation. Far away, Raymond Louis, industrial designer of the 1950s, 1960s, he stated already in the 1960s that in his experience, successful products or services are always the combination of most advanced yet acceptable. And of course, that still goes for the work we do also for our clients. We are on the brink of sometimes the technology or what's really feasible or viable but also you should bring in the desirable part. And that's exactly what this guy, Tim Brown of IDEO, uh, stated almost 10 years ago. He's, I think, one of the, well, fathers of the definition of design thinking. He almost invented it with his agency and a lot of peers in that period. But um, yeah, he's quite clear that the real magic and innovation especially happens where we combine technology, business, but also the context and the user. And probably some of you almighty know this methodology or this model, mental model, in which you say that real innovation, real good innovation is always a combination of people, desirability, where design comes in, and of course, business and technology. And I think most companies we work with Business and technology are most of all, most of all, dominant. And desirability 
is the thing that we should make more stable, make more having impact. Well, so it's quite clear, as Andy and Jay already also stated, business seems ready, but are we ready as designers uh, to validate what we're doing? Um, if you look at the World Economic Forum every year in Switzerland, in Davos, um, people there, business leaders, are really, really convinced that there is a sort of new kind of industrial revolution going on. Um, the first one was, of course, about mechanics. The second one about mass production. And the third one, which is already almost coming to an end, is about automate stuff. And we're now in the let's say transformation period to I think a period of synergy where we have the physical world, the digital work world and the biological world merging together in new sets of product service combinations. And I think that's really interesting. Think alone of healthcare, the internet of things, artificial, artificial intelligence, the quantified self, um, developments, concepts in which EPEM is already doing great stuff, but also has the footprint to build upon that. So there are existing times ahead, and that's also about the skills that are desired uh, to make that happen. Um, I think if you look at those kind of skills, which are declining on one hand and growing or emerging on the other hand, um, a lot of the growing skills are really closely related to innovation, technology, design, UX, definitions that are still growing and growing also within EPAM. Yes, and this is already shared by Andy and Jay. Uh, there's a lot of research out which proves that design can be accountable for, that design is able to deliver value, concrete, tangible value. value. Um, I go through this quite quick. The Design Council in England does have a lot of interesting cases in that field. Like in the Netherlands, um, we did a research in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands Design um, Council, and all over big companies, big brands, small and medium sized businesses as well. When design was really put into the heart of the operation, was taken seriously, was managed professionally, um, all over profits were raising with 20%. And this is in Hong Kong, the design management conference in 2017 at the Hong Kong Polytechnic. This is Professor Jane Lietka from uh, a very uh, known uh, business school in uh, the United States. And she really held a very good plea for design and especially creative thinking to solve the challenges for big organizations in the five or 10 years ahead. And she is really convinced that a design mindset is capable to bring creativity in that kind of settings. And that is really needed when you talk about value, added value, not only on the short term, but also on the long term. Um, what's also interesting about Jane Lipka is that she observes how MBA business schools are changing worldwide in their curriculum. And 20 years ago, design or design thinking or innovation was hardly to be found in curriculums of MBAs. And nowadays, almost 90% of all the MBAs in the Western world is teaching the students uh, some kind of design, creative kind of uh, courses. And that is also an interesting phenomenon. We're not the only designers around or people with a design mindset at our agencies, but also at our clients. There's more and more business people who also have an idea and understanding of the value of design. Good. Um, if you have ever uh, read the Harvard Business Review, um, it's a very good magazine every month about very interesting research into business, but also into innovation, transformation. Um, this was a, a decisive moment almost uh, uh, in 2016 when that magazine, which is really uh, uh, read by a lot of people on sea level, um, 
uh, was really publishing about the need and the value, the necessity, necessity of introducing design thinking and design thinking mindset in organizations. I'm going to McKinsey uh, and the NJ already touched upon that. Um, of course, McKinsey is uh, really important if you talk to a certain kind of C-level people. Um, they not only started their own design company or a design department, as Andy and Jay showed, but this research from uh, two years ago is really interesting because it really shows where design makes the difference. And of course, talking about it, um, it's not only this kind of research that helps us with clients, it's also a matter of how you're going to implement it. Well, um, back to UX. Design and UX are quite familiar and quite close to each other. Um, what's really hard sometimes to find, but in the last couple of years it's emerging and it's really of great value, is that there's still more qualitative and quantitative data available regarding the added value of UX. And for instance, this is just a very small selection of some of the sources online. Uh, UX does have a lot of value for online, especially for e-commerce. Sometimes people think of UX only as, okay, uh, a good usability, yes, but there's a lot of different other kind of gains possible regarding UX. These 13 is uh, a sort of selection. Um, uh, this is a uh, scheme that more, let's say, clusters those um, benefits. Um, and especially when you talk with uh, clients and discuss the need for having UX as a very central, very important part of your development cycle, these kind of arguments can and will help us. So if you look at commerce, omnichannel, e-commerce, and you see what UX can bring to the table, there are some really important direct gains, but also direct savings. And it's not only a matter of logical thinking, it's really a matter of doing research, make zero measurements up front, start working, start measuring, and start improving. And for instance, if you look at a very important gain, Yes, turnover or margin, but especially in e-commerce, the average order value is sometimes the most important KPI. And on the other hand, if a good UX is helping your clients, helping them to do their jobs to be done in a very smooth, effective, seamless way, you see a lot of reduction in problems, issues, complaints, and also uh, the need for customer care. Forrester, um, of course, important uh, kind of research uh, company, especially online also, is uh, really looking at UX in the last two, three years. And really, really important to emphasize is that a high quality of UX delivers, for instance, uh, more loyal customers, more peer-to-peer, -peer, worth per mouth kind of recommendations and better payments. And here comes the business case. Uh, UX delivers really a lot of uh, return on investment. Um, two cases from uh, Forrester, um, Walmart in America and Bank of America also in the States. It's quite impressive. You see that you really can have quantitative data, impressive data, thanks to improvements in UX. McKinsey, yes, they did a lot of research into design, but also if you look at the uh, present actual situation, the COVID-19 crisis, it's really interesting to see what happened in the last, let's say, crisis in the 2008-2009 period. And what uh, McKinsey found out is that organizations and companies who were really having a clear view on customer experience and were really investing in it, and implementing it in the whole way of working were really, really more successful 
in the growth after the crisis, almost three times higher returns. So especially in a recession, most companies are, well, more or less not willing to invest in UX or in design, not innovating because it's too scary. Um, and this shows that especially in this kind of period, it pays off just to do so. But that, of course, uh, takes some strength uh, and you need guts to do so. Good, um, Bain & Company, um, I will we'll go through this uh, a little bit quick, um, but also they did a lot of research into UX, especially for B2B, which is a bit more different than B2C sometimes. Um, and especially retention, huh? the ability to have your customers in and have them as stable customers is really important in business. And UX, again and again, helps to have more retention. Yes, um, uh, this one to finish off this part, I think, huh, is really about uh, companies that have user experience in place. Um, yeah, they really outperform better other companies. And uh, for instance, um, look at uh, the return on investment, which is always a good one if you really speak to financial people. Um, every dollar in UX invested brings on average a hundred dollar in return. And those are numbers that we should be able to use ourselves in our own cases and our own cases for our clients. And yes, it's the same with using tools like personas, wireframing or usability testing. When people ask you why is that needed, why does it cost X money? Well, take a look at this kind of validation. Good. So yeah, good design means good business. That's true. Um, what's important, I think, is to emphasize that we really should be learning as designers and UX professionals to follow the numbers. Far more uh, focusing on the return of investment of design. Um, have really the good proper sources uh, to prove not only hard value, but also soft value. And the way to achieve this is, I think, especially your way of working, mentality, culture. Um, also start measuring and building cases as soon as we can, even in pre-sales sometimes. And also <clears throat> have the ability to tell a good story. Um, frame it in the right way, keep it simple, understandable, and get to know your audience. If you have to talk about sea level issues, be prepared. Also, if you have to talk to other stakeholders in the organization, have the sensitivity to create the story in different ways. And yes, in the end, about design and business, it's all about a paradigm. Uh, design is more than aesthetics. Good. Um, looking at the time, um, if you look at, let's say, the present state of industry and especially our clients, I think they come from a period in which they had an industrial kind of approach with silos, standardization, steering on um, efficiency. Um, and now we're going to a period in which we have far more and far more complex kind of challenges. This is a nice one from the Delft Design School at the University of Delft. And it shows that, of course, we come from a product design period and now I'm moving to more experience design, service design and even system design. And also the capabilities and the skill sets we need to do so is becoming more mature. If we talk about service design, for instance, or system design, uh, we're not talking about aesthetics anymore, but more or less about solving complex challenges, what we call wicked problems. And wicked problems are roughly always fuzzy, complex, there are dynamics, and it has many, many stakeholders involved. And I think what Jay and Andy showed before, design ops can also be a way to deal with this kind of 
complex settings as UX research and UX politics or strategy uh, is. So we need a new tool set, a new skill set. Um, and um, thinking about this, um, I think uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff around uh, to use and to adapt to. Of course, the double diamond, this is a very simple and this is a more, let's say, uh, enriched one. But this is already what we are doing a lot in EPEN, in our discovery kind of approach. Uh, designing the right thing and designing things right. From discover to define to develop to deliver. And of course, that's an interesting approach, but especially this one in the bottom. Don't forget to test it. I think that's also an important one. Um, this is just a visual that is used by KLM before the COVID crisis broke out, where KLM is able to run the business and also innovate in a parallel track. We do the same as EPAM here in the Netherlands with Ziggo, for instance, which is an interesting kind of extra layer of uh, services we provide. Because big organizations are most of the times super tankers who are on a course, and we really need to help them become more agile. Um, this is also an interesting one because here it shows that on one hand you have design thinking. Yes, we know we can deliver that, we can do that. But more and more organization wants to prove that an idea is in an MVP correct to bring to the market. And especially doing that in an agile, scrim-like approach. Um, and this shows that, in fact, if you combine those three, design thinking, lean startup, and Agile, um, you're bringing a lot of more interesting, relevant tools in your toolbox, in your tool set. In the end, I think it's my plea, uh, we should be able to have a user-centered design process uh, in place in which you have a long-standing relationship with your clients, do a lot of stuff together, have a product life cycle in place, product management in place, a product vision, and make sure that you test, check, build, validate, and iterate, improve in a constant cycle. That's more or less the ideal world, the ideal approach. Um, yeah, which brings me to EPEM, and just to short, show you two cases from our Dutch team. Um, first of all, um, we did some great stuff uh, with Ziggo, um, Vodafone Ziggo as it is today, in which uh, we were asked to validate a concept of a loyalty program. And what was happening is that business and technology was really dominant, really defining the whole process. And in fact, the user, the UX, uh, the real customer was not yet in this program. So what we did was make really sure that we had outcome, actionable outcome from user research for, let's say, redef redefine the scope and the focus, and also have all the valuable input to prioritize the MVP backlog. Um, so where did UX and design makes a difference in this case? I think through user research on a certain moment, we had the opportunity to challenge the business and technology, and also to challenge the classic marketing. Uh, classic marketing is always about, we know what's good for you. And real customers, are having sometimes a different perception about that. And that's interesting. And of course, yes, we had the opportunity to gain relevant insights. Uh, not only generic stuff, but also really specific customer stuff. Um, and by doing that, we and our product owner and stakeholders in Photophone Sigo were able to push back on the already developed MVP scope in a good way. And that was a bit of last but not least, but very important, have a set of new arguments for the what's next after the MVP discussion. And what was the concrete impact? Yeah, I think uh, we made the loyalty program in a conceptual phase still more valuable, feasible, but also desirable. Um, and we had a very good holistic view on what's really needed. We redefined the roadmap, we define the scope and the backlog. And I think all in all, we created value 
to make that loyalty program in the midterm and the long term much more success. Happy to share it with you face to face later on, but this is a program which is still under NDA, so I can't share too much. Second one, Albert Heijn. Big Dutch supermarket retailer, part of Albert Ahel Dalhuizen. Um, as I already showed you in the beginning, Albert Heijn is really making progress to become also not only omnichannel retailer, but also a bit of a technology company. So digital online is becoming more and more important. What we asked to do was make the internal Albert Heijn UX and design team more important, have better capabilities in place, facilitate and coach them to get to a certain degree in which they have and develop stopping power against technology and business, especially from doing right things to, to do the right things in the right order. So what we did, we made a digital adaption of the corporate strategy. We discovered what really delivers value for the customer, the end user. And based on that, we defined where design comes in and UX. Um, we did a lot of interviews. We gathered a lot of best practices, industry conventions. We made a benchmark of the situation as is and a very good, I think, gap analysis. And based on that, we defined both a plan of approach, which was really actionable, and we delivered the roadmap for the implementation. And what really, I think, created the most impact was that doing this plan of approach roadmap, we were also able to build a business case for UX in Albert Heijn Digital. And that really proved very valuable for the C-level in Albert Heijn and paid off for the UX team and the UX lead in the long term. Doing this, we also aligned all owners and stakeholders and we were able to contribute to build to a new digital product oriented team. And by having this in place, a new kind of internal culture was also developing. And I think in this way, we show that we were not doing actual design work at the core, but we made sure that we facilitated, coached, and uh, really uh, empowered the design and UX and research team that was already there based on our experience and based on our, let's say, skill set. Good. To finish off, I think if you look at UX research, the value of UX, the value of design for organizations, um, what's really important to step uh, as a first step in a step in a series of three is um, especially to have a very good assessment upfront and really are able to judge the maturity of an organization, whether it's an existing account of EPM or a new account, but especially with a new account, this is a very crucial first step. To give you an idea, you can have UX in different ways, from very functional at the bottom to very meaningful uh, in the top. But it really, really depends on where an organization comes from. The same goes for maturity in UX. Uh, you have a lot of this kind of laddering models like the design ladder also, but this UX maturity model, which is a bit inspired of what the Norman Nielsen group does, is from unrecognized, step one, to completely embedded. And my personal view is that a lot of accounts of EPEN are really already in phase two or three, probably even four, but for us it's the challenge, and I think a very nice challenge to bring them to five and even six where UX is really like design and design ops in the heart of the organization, the heart of way of working. There's no discussion anymore. It's a logical way uh, to, to, to develop products and services that matter. Second step, I think it's always good to start small. Even if you have the odds against you, try to find one of two let's say sponsors, or opportunities, or even invest in sort of startups kind of research or startup kind of project uh, in which you can make it with simple kind of tooling, simple kind of setup, uh, concrete, tangible. 
be prepared. And then, based on that kind of simple, almost let's say startup kind of approach, um, you can create visibility, you can create success, you can start to tell a story, you can start to build a case, and then it starts to have sponsors aboard, decision makers aboard. So, I hope I'm still within my time frame. <laughs> Um, I think it's a lot of information, uh, but I try to make a more holistic kind of journey. My personal background experience, then the trends in the industry, the way organizations look at creative thinking, design, UX, and how we as EPM can really tap into that development, need to tap into the development and make it uh, our own together, of course, with our uh, clients. Well, I think that's about it. Emily, will you take yes. over? Yes, sure. Thank you so much, Peter. It's very informi informative speech. Um, I think our audience is a little quiet today. If you have any <laughs> questions, make sure you post it so we can see your question. Uh, I do have some here. Um, maybe I'll ask first, first one. Um, talking about the value of design, do you think that understanding of this value is bigger in physical product design than in UX? It's a good question. Um, of course, if you look at industrial kind of products like a car or a smartphone or um, uh, furniture, uh, there is a tradition of more than 100 years in proving the value of design. Um, in digital or even in services, that tradition is really, really uh, more recent. Uh, it's only probably 15 or 20 years. So we're still in the, let's say, phase in which we build accountability, build validation. But as I hopefully shared with you, some serious guys and girls like McKinsey, like Forrester, uh, are really doing a lot of interesting, Gartner as well, a lot of interesting research and sharing uh, their cases if it, if they are allowed to do so. Yeah. Cool. So that, uh, hopefully an answer to your question. Okay. This belongs to Yuri. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, uh, I have another question actually about your uh, talk. Um, so when, when, when you said you were challenging the business and marketing design uh, decision, in the loyalty program project, like how do you make sure the stakeholders listen to to the designers and listen to the impact we, we want to give? Um, I think it's always about politics, especially in bigger organizations and Vodafone Zego is kind of a few mergers. So it's a big organization and still is also a, a combination of two existing brands. Um, I think we were quite lucky that we had a, a product owner from their side who was really, I think, smart and capable uh, to involve both people on sea level as well cross silo. And I think that's the most important thing about user experience and customer experience in general, that it's, if you take it seriously, should go through all the classic silos. So it's about HRM, it's about finance, it's about yeah, operations, it's about marketing, communication, branding. Um, so in this loyalty program, uh, most silos were recognized and already available and uh, committed, uh, but not designed. And I think this research made the possibility or made it clear that design and UX should be really also in this project. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. I think I, I I really want to talk about this topic with you one, all day long, but we're we're at the time. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, though. Thank you, our audience for joining. Uh, we have the next stop, uh, next talk in five minutes. So take a little break and come back to another link. I believe you have to join. Yeah. Joining. OK, see you guys later. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.